So, um, I hope you can hear me now on the live stream. Um, so that should be working. Um, if you can't hear me, please do um, raise your, your hand. Um, or, well, I guess you can't raise your hand if you don't hear me. Um, but uh, if, you, if you can hear me, um, give me a thumbs up. Um, there's a little bit of a lag on this uh, on this video stream, so um, so you should be uh, you should be um, able to hear this in a, in a couple of seconds. So um, can everyone can anyone hear me um, through the live stream? Please give a, a thumbs up if you can hear me. No thumbs ups. Okay, someone's listening. Um, so, okay, I see there's still some, uh, some technical difficulties um, with the live stream. Um, so some of you are uh, are giving up, uh, um, giving a thumbs up. So clearly you can uh, you can hear something, um, but others are apparently not able to hear yet, right? So Okay, so um, let's get started on the live stream here. Um, so again, if you have any questions, uh, you should be able to just put them in the chat. Um, that will be the easiest way. Uh, you all should be able to talk to each other, um, but we have to uh, go through the live stream to be able um, to, to do this at scale. Apparently there's limitations to the um, Gather Town platform that limit it to, uh, um, to only 100 people at the moment. So they're working on, on making this work for 150 people, which is why it was, uh, was not working last time. Um, so in any case, um, the live stream is being recorded. Um, so you will be able to watch this even if you have some dif difficulties uh, right now. Um, I'm going to type this in here in the chat because I see there's questions about that. Um, so today what we're gonna talk about is a little bit this, uh, um, this issue of units and measurements and dimensional analysis, which uh, um, was uh, already the case during, um, during the problem that you just looked at. Um, so we're gonna talk about that a little bit more. Um, and, and then we're gonna go on and uh, talk a little bit about vectors, just recap about um, vectors in, uh, in general and stuff that you should have been able, um, stuff that should be familiar already to you um, and then kinematics, um, or in other words, one-dimensional um, one uh, um, uh, motion um, along, a, along a line. Uh, so that's just going to introduce some, some terminology mainly. So let's start with dimensional analysis. So we've um, taught, used that in the, in the homework assignment. And so dimensional analysis essentially is about um, thinking about what um, dimensions a particular quantity is in. So if we have, let's see, where's, oh, um, sorry, give me a second. It's not um, using the, the tablet is not configured correctly. Da -da -tum. Let's tablet, one second. I had to reboot my computer right before this. So, okay. So in dimensional analysis, what we do is um, look at the, the dimensions of certain quantities. So if we have, for example, a position R, the dimension will be length. Um, if we turn something, a dimension of length into a, um, into a surface area, for example, if we have a surface area A, which will be in units of length in one direction, length in the other direction. So this will be 
you know, if we think about the, the dimension of uh, the surface area of a square with a side A, then the surface area A will be A squared, and the dimension of that will be length squared, right? Um, so that's one type of dimension, the length, and so it can have different powers. Volume will have dimension length to the third and so on. Um, there's, of course, other types of dimensions that we can have. Um, if we think about time, time will have the dimension of time. Um, if we combine length and time into velocity, which we'll talk about later, um, that's going to be length over time or length times time to the power minus one. Um, and of course, in physics, everything will have to be dimensionally consistent. If we have an equation, if we have uh, an, an equation or, or any expression, um, for example, um, if we have one half a um, t squared plus v times t plus x, um, let's call this x zero for reasons that will become clear later, then we know if this is in units, if x zero is in units of length, in dimensions of length, then vt will have to be in units of length as well, and one half a t squared will have to be in units of length. Otherwise, we're adding literally apples and oranges. Um, it is. Uh, it would be adding um, things with different units, and of course, that doesn't work out. Uh, and so in equations, in expressions, any term will always have to have the same dimension. Um, and if we know that we're asked, for example, to get, get a position, then, um, then we can use dimensional analysis to limit, um, uh, to, to restrict what, um, what combinations of terms are going to be possible. So I see some questions um, in, uh, in the chat. So um, the, the video is being recorded. It will be uh, live. It will be um, at the same place as the live link after the, the lecture. Um, so right now you cannot go forward and backward in the stream. Um, this is mainly to make sure that everyone's synchronized um, and to reduce the, the bandwidth issues. Um, but you will be able to see all of this after the fact and it will be recorded. It's actually being recorded both on, um, on, on YouTube itself uh, and it is being recorded here locally on my laptop. So uh, if, if, even if something screws up with, uh, with YouTube, um, it, uh, it will be locally available. Okay, back to dimensional analysis. Um, so if, if you can hear that, just give me a thumbs up and uh, um, uh, so I know how many of you are actually now on the stream. Okay, good. And uh, I, I can see that uh, the, the latency is a lot, uh, a lot better than it was earlier in, in the class. So uh, um, I can see responses pretty much within um, two or three seconds. So that's good. Okay, so a quick question then about uh, dimensional analysis. Um, Let's say I have a problem with given quantities that are in, um, uh, let's say I have a given quantity that's, that's some parameter lambda, which happens to be 614 nanometers. So in other words, lambda has dimensions of length. Uh, and I have a, another given quantity that is C, which is three times 10 to the eight meters per second. So the dimensions of C are in length times time to the minus one. Um, now I'm asked to determine a frequency. So let's call that nu. Um, and the units or the dimensions of, of uh, frequency are inverse time, so per second. Um, so if I know that these are my given quantities and I'm asked for a frequency, which one of the following is most likely to be correct? Lambda times C, lambda over C, C over lambda, one over lambda C, or lambda plus C. So um, I will ask you um, to vote for that. Uh, so press one, two, three, four, or five, depending on, on what you think is the, is the correct answer. 
So I see some people pressing some. Um, I see a lot of, uh, of, of festive um, symbols for number three. Um, and that's of course correct. So three is going to be the right dimension because if we combine C, which has dimensions of length times inver inverse time with lambda, which has dimensions of length and we di divide those, then we can see that the dimensions of C over lambda will be inverse time. And so that's of course the dimension of, uh, of frequency that we're looking for. Um, so this is how dimensional analysis will be, um, will be useful. Just by looking at the dimensions here and here, we can figure out that this, these four options are, are impossible to be right. Um, and so this is something you'll want to use during your um, homework problems uh, because you know it's, it's, a, it's a very easy way to check um, whether what you are um, whether what you, you got in the end as an answer, whether it even makes sense. And the dimensions have to be correct, right? Um, so when you do a problem, um, the, the dimensions have to be correct and you typically will want to make sure that the order of magnitude is somehow reasonable as well. Okay, so that's all about um, dimensional analysis. I just wanted to say, um, so let's go back to the slides here. Um, I just want to go quickly um, over some of this, this vector stuff because we will be using vectors a lot in this course. And I want to make sure everyone's on the same page. Um, so who can tell me um, what a vector is? What are the two important properties of a vector quantity that distinguish it, distinguishes it from a scalar quantity? So thanks for uh, for putting that in the chat. That's excellent. So what we need for a vector quantity is is to have a direction and a magnitude, and it's important that there's a direction to it. Um, so let's uh, let's do a couple of questions here again. Um, so if I talk about um, if I talk about let's say temperature, is temperature a vector quantity? So um, Use uh, one to say yes, and uh, um, I guess use five <laughs> to say no. <laughs> so indeed, um, the, the temperature is not a, a vector quantity, it's a scalar quantity. Um, you might think, well, it has a direction because you can have positive and negative temperatures. Um, but it's, it's still just a scalar quantity. The, the, the direction of temperature doesn't actually mean anything. Um, now, if we talk about um, velocity, now then we're talking about a vector quantity. It has a direction. We can have a, ve a velocity that is pointing in, in a particular direction. Um, uh, you know, the velocity could be to the left, could be to the right, could be upwards, could be at 37 degrees with respect to a certain direction. Um, so there's a there's a directionality to velocity that we don't have um, in the case of, of temperature, mass, energy, angles, and so on. Now, there's, there's some that are a little bit trickier, and I'll come back to that when we start talking about kinematics, and that's when we talk about the difference between position, which is the coordinate along an axis, and um, uh, displacement, which is the difference in positions um, between a start point and an end point. Um, so typically the way to turn a scalar quantity into a vector quantity involves looking at differences between an initial and a final point because then it suddenly introduces the direction. So you could argue that if temperature is a scalar quantity, a difference in temperature has more properties of direction. So um, it could be a temperature increase or a temperature decrease. And so that direction turns it into um, a, a one-dimensional vector quantity. Um, so let's look through uh, some of the, the slides here, which again, I'll post, um, which have some vector um, properties. Uh, and, and I'll go through this fairly quickly because for most of you, this will be, um, will be a recap. Uh, so of course, vectors can be parallel. That's when the direction is the same, even if um, the, the magnitude is different. 
If they're anti-parallel, it means that they're pointing in opposite directions. Uh, so A is anti-parallel to B in this case because they're pointing in opposite directions or they have an angle between them that's 180 degrees. Um, A is anti-parallel always to its negative. Um, so A is anti-parallel to minus A. Um, A and B are equal if they have the same direction and the same magnitude, even if they're working at a different point. So um, we'll see this with forces. Uh, we, can, we can have forces apply on an object at different points. The force can still be the same regardless of which, um, uh, which point it actually um, applies at, uh, but the vector just has a direction and a magnitude. It, doesn't, it isn't defined by um, which point it actually applies to. And then of course we can have orthogonal vectors, which is when um, their directions are orthogonal. And vectors can be orthogonal to each other, even if they're not applying at the same point. Vector addition is something you're also um, likely familiar with. So if we have two vectors A and B that we want to add, then um, we draw the little parallelogram here um, and the diagonal is going to be the addition of the vectors. Or another way to, um, to, to think about this is we put one vector first and then um, tip to toe, we, we put the next vector um, in the series there and we, we keep following the, the, the vectors when we put them, um, put them head to toe. The difference in vectors is just um, adding the vector with the anti-parallel vector um, or minus B uh, for, for the second vector. So A minus B is the same as A plus the anti-parallel minus B vector. Uh, and then of course we end up with um, A plus minus B. So that will be again this diagonal in the parallelogram. Uh, so multiple vectors we just add by putting them uh, head to toe. So A plus C plus B, um, or actually we started with D here. So we start with D plus A plus C plus B. That gives us the sum of all of these four vectors. Um, and it doesn't matter in which order you do it. These are, are commut commutative um, properties. So A plus B is the same as B plus A. Um, we can add A plus B first and then add C to it, or we can add A to the sum of B plus C. Uh, none of that makes any difference. The, the addition of vectors is, is commutative, is associative, is distributive. If I multiply a vector with a scalar quantity um, and add um, a, another scalar quantity multiplied with a different vector, with the same vector, then it will be the sum of those scalar quantities multiplied with that vector. So, um, and of course the scalar multiplication with a vector increases the magnitude without changing the direction. Um, we'll often want to use vectors in uh, their scalar component. So um, if we have a vector, for example, here, vector D, um, it has a component along the x-axis. In this case, it's pointing to the negative x-axis and it has a component along the y-axis. The magnitude is going to be dx squared plus dy squared with the square root. And the angle it makes with the positive x-axis is going to be given by the arctangent of um, d uh, by the yeah by the arctangent of of dy over dx. Um, we'll introduce these unit vectors j and i along the x-axis and along the y-axis, pointing in the positive x and positive y direction. Um, in, in addition to writing this as i hat and j hat, you'll see me write x hat, um, y hat, z hat. Um, anything that has a hat on it is a unit vector in the direction of the vector um, that, uh, that in, in the direction of the, the letter that uh, is indicated. So we will also talk about r hat. We might even introduce phi hat. Um, phi hat would be a vector, a unit vector that is in the direction of phi. So it's going around the circle. Um, so again here, magnitude and angle in, this, in the components um, the, the, the magnitude is, uh, is, is given by Pythagorean theorem um, and the angle is, is given by the arctangent of Ay over Ax. Um, and of course here we have the, um, the formulas for that. 
Um, in, in two dimensions, if we have the, the end point x e and y e, those are the coordinates of the end point, and we have the coordinates of the beginning point of the vector, we can calculate the scalar components of the vector itself by taking the component wise differences. So x e minus x b is going to be the x component of the vector, um, y e minus y b is going to be the y component of the vector. So um, if I'm going too fast, let me know. Um, there, I think most of you will probably have seen this material before. Um, so uh, give me a thumbs up if, if this is, you know, this is well known material um, because it will have to be for, uh, for the course um, uh, because this is something that we're gonna be using a lot in, uh, in this course, not just in two dimensional vectors, but also three dimensional vectors. Um, if we take the sum of vectors, we can also do this in terms of the components. So if we have a resultant vector um, and we want to calculate the x component of the resultant vector, we can just use the sum of all of the x components of the individual vectors. So in this case, the x component of the sum of, this is minus 3b, a, and c, will be the x component. The x component of that resultant will be the x component of minus 3b, plus the x component of A, plus the x component of C. The y components will also be um, the y components individually added. Uh, so you can, you can do vector math both with just the vector descriptions, um, or you can do the vector math with the components. And depending on which problem we're doing, um, it may be useful to, to first do some stuff with just vector notation and vector algebra itself, before in the end going to um, uh, to the, the decomposition in, uh, into um, the individual components. We'll talk about polar vectors. So I already introduced this r hat here. T hat is essentially what I called phi hat earlier. So it's the, um, the, it's the unit vector perpendicular to the, the polar um, uh, radial vector. So in this case, we have a radial vector here uh, with, with length r, and r is of course the magnitude of this vector. Um, so r hat is gonna be the unit vector in that direction. T hat or phi hat is going to be the vector along, oops, along the phi direction. So in some sense, along the direction of phi. So at this point here, it's going to be along this phi direction, tangential to a circle um, around the origin. Uh, I, I will point out here, um, which is uh, something I need to do in every course where there's engineers. Um, in physics, we will use phi as the polar angle um, in, in two-dimensional coordinates and theta as the, the polar angle in, in spherical coordinates. So this differs from some conventions in engineering. Um, so so it, may, it will be important to keep track of what theta and phi we're actually talking about. So don't assume that because you see a theta, in three-dimensional spherical coordinates that it is automatically something that can go from zero to two pi. Um, theta in physics in three-dimensional problems typically will go from zero to pi. Um, so we can of course go to three-dimensional vectors as well. So then we don't just have um, i hat and j hat, but we have i hat, j hat, and k hat, um, where k hat or x hat, uh, excuse me, or z hat, <clears throat> is along the z direction. Um, these three axes form a right-handed coordinate system, uh, which means that if you, you use your, your hand, you can have your thumb pointing along the i component or the x component. You can you have your index finger point towards the, the y direction and your middle finger will point towards the z direction. So this kind of right-handed coordinate system, this right-hand rule, if you want, um, is going to be important in, in, in several aspects. Uh, we will come back to that and, and you'll certainly see that in the second um, semester uh, of, uh, of, of this course. We can split a, uh, a, a, a three-dimensional vector also into its uh, scalar um, components. So um, we can have an X component, Y component and Z component, just like with two-dimensional vectors, except now it's gonna be in three dimensions. Okay, so um, that's probably 
um, a lot of repetition. Um, uh, now we're getting into things that might be not as uh, in front of your mind, um, which is the dot product um, and the cross product. Uh, so the dot product is going to be the thing uh, or, or scalar product is the product between two vectors that returns a scalar. So it returns a number, it turns two vectors into a number. Um, and as you know, the dot product is defined by the length of one vector times the length of the other vector times the cosine of the angle between them. So yeah, we're talking about the dot product, Jamie. Um, so um, the, the geographical or, or the geometric interpretation um, of this dot product is that we're actually projecting one vector onto the other vector. So here we're projecting A and the magnitude of A onto this direction of B, which gives us our A times cosine phi, and then multiplying that with the length of B. And that turns out to be the exact same as if you did it the other way around. If you projected B onto the direction of A and multiplied that B times cosine theta with the length uh, or the magnitude of A. So um, think of the dot product as how much of vector A is in the direction of vector B. And of course, if that angle is 90 degrees, then none of vector A is along the direction of vector B. So vectors that are perpendicular will have a zero dot product. So some properties here. So we have the definition, of course. Again, this is commutative. There's a distributive property. Um, you can do this in terms of scalar components. So then it's just a product of the, the X components plus the product of the Y components plus the product of the Z components. Since it's defined with this angle here, we can actually turn this around and use the dot product to measure the angle. So if we have the dot product and we divide by the lengths of A and B individually, then we'll get the cosine of the angle between those, um, uh, b between those uh, vectors. Um, and because the basis vectors, the unit vectors of our three-dimensional axis system are all perpendicular to each other, um, we have these relations that um, I hat and J hat um, have a dot product that is zero, and that's true for any combination of, of three um, unit vectors in the three-dimensional system. Um, so I will be posting uh, the slides to UM Learn. So besides the dot product, we also have the cross product. Um, the cross product is uh, when we, or, or this is called the vector product, um, because this turns one vector, um, uh, the, turns the product of a vector with another vector into a third vector. So C is now going to be a vector quantity. That's a product between two vectors that turns into a vector quantity rather than a scalar quantity um, like in, uh, um, in the dot products case. Um, so the definition now is going to be that the, the cross product gives us a vector along a direction that is perpendicular to both A and B. So it's perpendicular to the plane that is described by the vectors a and b. And the magnitude of this vector um, c of the cross product is the magnitude of a times the magnitude of b times the sine of the angle. So again, we can look at um, the definition here. The magnitude of a cross b is a b times sine phi. Um, we have um, now a different property here that if we have, um, we have no commutative property, we have an anti-commutative property. So if you have A cross B, that's actually gonna be minus B cross A. We do still have a distributive property. Um, the cross products of the unit vectors um, are uh, rotate into each other. So I, J gives us K, J, K gives us I, and K, I gives us J. Um, so think of this as, you know, you write a triplet I, J, K, and any two following give us the third one, and then you rotate through um, to the start again. We will be using these properties as we need them. Um, so certainly we will be using cross products um, later in the semester when we start talking about torque. Um, and then we will indeed use, for example, this expression here um, of the cross product in terms of its scalar components, which might seem like a lot, 
Um, but again, there's, uh, there's ways to simplify that. And typically we'll actually be, um, be able to use just the first expression here, um, which is the simplest, uh, the simplest uh, um, expression. So again, let's go back here. The cross product is the vector that is perpendicular to the plane spanned by um, the vectors A and B. And the magnitude of this, so that gives us the direction if it's perpendicular to a plane. And the magnitude of C of this cross product is the magnitude of A times the magnitude of B times the sine of that angle. Um, and this anti-commutative property is actually given here as well, um, because if we, if we go from A to B, or we go from B to A, that actually changes the direction of our angle phi, right? Um, and because changing the sign of our angle phi changes, is changing the sign S-I-G-N of angle phi also changes the sign S-I-N-E of phi. So if this changes the sign of sine phi, um, that actually will have the the the, um, the vector product point in the um, in the opposite direction, depending on whether we have a first or b first. So where are we going to use this? Um, well, apart for um, corkscrews for opening um, uh, bottles, uh, we will also use it uh, in uh, in relation to torque and rotation. So if you have, for example, um, a wrench and there's a, a, a distance from the center of rotation that's given by a vector r, and there's a force that applies at this distance r. If we now apply this force in this direction, which is essentially pushing around in this direction, that will give us a torque that is pointing in that direction, and the vector product between this vector r and the vector f will give us the torque, and we'll talk more about that. If we have the force pointing in a different direction, now we're pointing, now we're rotating in that direction in a sense. And so the torque will now be in a different direction uh, and uh, the, the vector product will point in the opposite direction. Um, and so uh, this is where these, these vector products will, uh, will play a, a big role um, and we'll see that come back, of course. Okay. So that's all about vectors. Um, if this went fast, and in particular for those of you who may not be as familiar with the, um, the, the, the vector product, I do encourage you to read the textbook um, section on that because this is going to be important. And in particular, I encourage you to reread it once we get um, to the second half of the term um, and we actually start using the vector product. So the vector product is going to be um, uh, very important at that point. I don't think we'll use vector product until we get to torque. So, okay. So now we're uh, we're already in chapter three. Um, we've we've covered units and measurements. Um, we've covered vectors. Um, those were both kind of uh, um, uh, repeat chapters of things you should have probably already seen. Um, now we're getting into kinematics, which, as a reminder, is the study of motion um, without regards to how that motion actually started. Um, without regards to the cause of the motion. So um, we, we just assume there's motion. Um, let's describe the motion. Um, so we're going to introduce basically some, some terminology here. Um, position, displacement, average velocity, instantaneous velocity, and, and speed. So let's start with position. Um, position is where am I along or where uh, where is something located along a coordinate axis? So in this case, um, the, uh, the position of, of the, the professor here is at x0, so for example, 1.5 meters, um, and the position changes to, for example, 3.5 meters. So this position here is a scalar quantity along this x direction. It doesn't have any directionality to it in itself. The position itself at any given time doesn't have any directionality to it. When does it receive directionality? When we start talking about displacement, when we're talking about the change in position from one point, from one point in time to another point in time. So now we have a vector that has a directionality. Um, so in this case, the vector is going in the positive x direction because the 
value of the position, the scalar quantity, changes in the positive direction. And the displacement has a direction in the positive has a direction in the positive x direction and a magnitude of two meters in this case. So displacement is is kind of like the the difference in temperature that I talked about earlier, um, where position would be the temperature itself. Um, displacement is the vector quantity, where position is the scalar quantity. So displacement has direction, position has no direction. And so we're talking about this here in one dimension, of course, um, and we'll extend this pretty quickly to um, two dimensions as well, where we're not just talking about displacement along the x-axis only, but we will introduce displacement along the y-axis. And then, of course, um, the displacement vector will be a two-dimensional vector, not just a one-dimensional vector constrained to the horizontal axis here. Now, if we have multiple steps in the displacement or mul multiple um, steps, for example, someone leaves home, walks for half a kilometer, walks back home, walks away from home um, for one kilometer and walks 1.75 kilometers back um, in, in these four different steps. This will be a displacement vector. This will be a displacement vector. This will be a displacement vector. And finally, this is a displacement vector. So the total displacement now is going to be the sum of those four displacement vectors. Notice that this is different from the total distance traveled. The distance traveled is half a kilometer plus another half a kilometer plus one kilometer plus 1.75 kilometers. The displacement, the total displacement is just going to be minus 0.75 kilometers. So keep in mind that total displacement will be different from um, total uh, distance traveled. And I'll give you one question now um, to talk, uh, to think about um, when is the magnitude of the total of, of the displacement, the total displacement, going to be equal to the distance traveled? In what condition do those um, uh, do those two quantities actually agree? So note that we have to talk about displacement um, as a with, with in terms of the magnitude, so we can turn it into a scalar quantity. Displacement is a vector quantity. The magnitude of displacement is a scalar quantity. Distance traveled is always a scalar quantity. It doesn't have any directionality to it. So it is already a scalar quantity. So yes, I, I see um, many of you are, are, are typing the correct answer um, in, in the chat. Uh, indeed, the boy band, one direction. Um, if everything is going into one direction, then um, there will be no difference between the magnitude of the displacement and the distance traveled. So we can show the, um, this one-dimensional um, uh, change in, in position versus time in a graph. So that will give us again here um, the, the distance traveled uh, or the, um, the position of, of, uh, of Jill here, first going 0.5 kilometers in the positive x direction. So that will be the 0.5 kilometers going in the positive x direction, 0.5 kilometers in the negative x direction, one kilometer to positive x, and 1.75 kilometers towards negative x. So we can draw this in this, um, in this diagram. And the average velocity now will be the displacement over the elapsed time. So in between zero and when we reach 0.5, kilometers here, the average velocity will be the distance, the, the displacement vector divided by the elapsed time. And let me just draw that here. Um, so the average velocity V average is the displacement delta X over delta t. So displacement over elapsed time. And this is, of course, a vector quantity because displacement itself is a vector quantity and we're just dividing it 
by elapsed time, which is a scalar quantity. Now, uh, let's get back to the slides here. There we go. Um, we can look at the average, um, the average uh, velocity between different times, for example, t1 and t6, the average velocity will be given by the slope of that line, right? Um, if we take the average veloci velocity between t2 and t5, we'll find the slope of this line. If we take the limit for t going to t0, we'll find the tangent here. The slope of the tangent line is going to be the instantaneous velocity, not just over a time interval, but at a specific um, point in time. So, and I'll, that will be the last thing here. The instantaneous velocity, uh, instantaneous velocity is the limit for um, delta t going to zero of dx over dt. And of course, you know from calculus that this is dx dt or actually d dt of x as a function of time. So if we have position as a function of time, then the derivative of that function will give us the instantaneous velocity. And so that of course gets back then to these kind of graphs where the derivative at every point will be the instantaneous velocity at that point in time. Um, and we'll stop with that here. Um, next time on Monday, we'll talk about speed um, as, a, as opposed to velocity. Um, and, uh, um, and, and that will be then uh, what we start with. Okay. Um, talk to you all on uh, Monday. And let me know if you have any chats. I'll be hanging out in, in Gattertown after, uh, after I close the, the stream here.